The 2020 election is fast approaching. There are a lot of important issues facing the cities of Huntsville and Madison, as well as Madison County. If you aren't already, you need to be tuned in on the issues that are impacting your city, community, neighborhood, and household. Do you know which candidates are aligned with your priorities and values? Today on Conversations Around the Coffee Table, I have three former candidates for public office who are working hard to impact our communities. We have a great show lined up for today, so let's get Get started. All right, folks, we are here with conversations around the coffee table, and I have three guests here this evening, and I will allow them some time to introduce themselves. So let's go ahead on and get started. All right, I'm uh, JB King. I am uh, here in Huntsville, former candidate of uh, Alabama State House District 10. I'm also a member of the Madison County Democratic Executive Committee, and I am the vice chair of youth affairs for the Alabama Democratic Conference. And glad to be here with you again, Jay. All right, I'm glad to have you. Well, thank you, Jay. This is my first uh, podcast ever, you know. Uh, I'm really excited to be here this evening. Uh, My name is Hanu Karlapalam. I'm a small business owner in technology. I'm a graduate of UH. I got my master's degree uh, from uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville. I mean, started my career uh, as a shift engineer on a uh, steel pipe manufacturing plant. Uh, grew up uh, as a kid on, on a family farm. Uh, I've been married for uh, 25 years to my wife, uh, beautiful wife, uh, Vidya. And uh, we have been living in the city of Madison, Alabama for almost 20 years. Uh, so I'm currently, you know, I'm an elected member of the State Democratic Executive Committee from House District 4. And you were and, just elected to that, right? Um, no, I was elected to the SDEC okay. uh, like last year along with our 2018 elections okay. uh, during the primary. Okay. Uh, but recently I got elected as the chairman of the Asia Pacific Islander uh, Caucus of the Alabama Democratic Party. Okay. And uh, I'm also... Uh, an editorial board member of uh, the uh, News Courier. It's a local community newspaper from Athens, uh, Limestone County, Alabama. Uh, I'm a former candidate, you know, who ran for uh, mayor of uh, the city of Madison in 2016. And I also ran for uh, county commissioner, Limestone County, District 3, uh, last year in uh, 2018. And... uh, I continue to be actively involved in the community. Uh, I'm still fighting to restore trust and uh, ensure transparency uh, in our uh, local governments as well as you know state and uh, federal levels. Hi, James. Um, as you've already said, my name is Amy Wasaluka. Like J.B. King, I ran for an office in 2018. I ran for State Senate District 2 here in Madison, Alabama, so a lot of you probably got tired of seeing my yard signs. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I am, I hold a youth seat on the um, State Democratic Executive Committee. I'm a member of the Madison County Democrats, the Madison County Democratic Women, and I currently serve as the president of the newly formed Alabama Democratic Women. Okay. Um, in addition to that, I'm working with a couple of local Democrats in the area on a messaging group called Plan for Progress. Cool. So... Here on Conversations Around the Coffee Table, we have leaders from our political community. And I wanted to have you guys here this evening because we're getting ready to, well, we're already in the 2020 election cycle. On TV, on radio, and social media, the presidential election gets 95% of attention. But 95% of what affects people happens at a local level. So I wanted us to talk this evening about elections, about voting, and how things get impacted when people are involved. So let's get started. First, let's talk about why local elections matter. Why are local elections important? Well, I'll jump in here. Um, This is JB, and you know, I really think it goes back to what you said. Most of what happens to us, most of what really affects our daily lives are the issues that our county commissioners and that our state House members and that our state representatives and that our school board and all of those local officers, uh, they, they make the mayor, uh, the city council, those are the people who make the decisions that affect our day-to-day lives, what our roads are like, 
what our tra- when our trash gets picked up. Um, all kinds of things that are important, and uh, you know, people people don't always realize that because the news is sucked up with what's going on, you know, at that at the top of the ticket all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, JB. This is Hano. Um, you know, most of the time, uh, people focus on national politics or you know, state level politics, or state level or national level elections, by neglecting uh, the local elections. Because I believe the local elections have a very big impact on the quality of life. Um, I mean, including, you know, the public safety, uh, your infrastructure. There's so many quality of life uh, indices, you know, that are depending on the local uh, local offices, you know, local government. Uh, just let me give you an example, you know. So take, for example, uh, uh, the city council or the mayor of a city. I mean, the mayor and the city council have the authority to, to appoint a police chief or the fire chief. And, you know, so it all depends on what kind of decisions they make. So if they don't make a good decision, you know, if they are not able to pick the best, you know, the highly professional and unbiased candidate as the police chief, uh, it definitely affects, you know, everyone in the community. So th- these are this is just one example. And economic development. So if uh, if they if they only give importance to their uh, um, big donors, you know, or special interest groups, then it's going to have a negative impact on 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 us, on on general public, and you know it might even result in uh, increasing uh, our taxes. So even though at the time of running for local election, they might say you know they are not in favor, but once they get into the office. So they just, you know, sneak in all those things. So I believe local local elections are really important. And also local elections uh, can also help stop uh, some of these extreme candidates, you know, getting elected, re-elected. You know, they start at the local level and they go on to the top. Just look at our own congressman. So he started at the local level. I mean, look what he's doing at the federal level now. So if we can stop such people at the local level, we will be definitely better off. Well, real, oh, sorry, Amy, but real quick, just a quick go back on what Hanu was saying. I wanted to point out that, you know, how uh, the tax angle uh, at a local level, if you think about how Republicans nationally position themselves, they always talk about how they're anti-tax. But at the local level here in Alabama, we don't get that at all from our Republicans. They keep raising the taxes on us. So that, that's kind of the other thing is being able to point out what's really happening locally without allowing local politicians to ride that national coattail. Mm-hmm. Well, so. and another important aspect to local elections and local politicians um, for people who are kind of new to politics, I like to tell them that your local politicians are the most accessible to you. They're in their communities more, they're able to meet with you, you're able to have an impact on them. A lot of elections, even at um, the state house or state senate election level, when you have special elections, can often be decided by a couple hundred votes. So these are elections that not only do you get to know your elected officials on a much deeper level than you would a federal official, but you also have the ability to physically impact that election if you so choose to. We kind of hinted at this earlier when we're looking at our two-party system. We have some elections or some offices that run where you only have one party, one person from one party running. How does that impact those bigger offices when you don't have people running at the local level? When you don't have people running at the local level and when you have kind of this um, loss of candidates who are rising up through the system, we're at a disadvantage. Um, Our system is meant to function as a two-party system, and that means both parties have to participate. Both parties have to put up candidates. Otherwise, we have a situation where you have far more candidates from one party who have experience, be it at a local level or a smaller level, and are able to run more effectively for higher position jobs. Does it have any impact on the excitement of voters when they don't have local candidates to vote for on the Democratic side or on the Republican side? What happens to those state level and national level candidates at that point when that excitement isn't there at the local level? Well, you know, again, I guess that goes to uh, what I was thinking Initially, you know, when you don't have a person on the ballot at the local level, then it kind of allows people, quite frankly, to remain uninformed on what's happening at the local level. 
You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword there where, you know, on the one hand, when you got to have somebody there, but on the other hand, that person who is there is now going to have to go out and make sure people know why they're there. You know, for me, when I was uh, running, I was running against a candidate who had not had anybody run against him for 16 years. And uh, when I knock on the door and I tell people what I was running for, they didn't even know what it was. And, and I guess not having someone there and not having someone take advantage of that type of uh, opportunity for an intimate relationship with the people uh, in, in your district or in your area, in your community, um, people get uh, complacent and and therefore they are not engaged. And, and you know, it, it's... It's really kind of a, it's one of those chicken and egg things is, you know, if you having a candidate isn't going to necessarily fix it, not having a candidate, you know, do you, does, does having a candidate, is that how you get the excitement? Do you have people get excited before you have a candidate? Like one of the things that I would honestly like to see the Democratic Party do is get people excited first. And then when those excited people are like, hey, you know, I haven't had anybody here run for this office. Uh, in a long time, once you get somebody there, you've already got a little bit of of, of a groundswell, of a coalition behind them. So do we do we have to have the candidate that excites the masses, or do we get the masses excited so the candidate knows when they enter the race, they've got some somebody's got their back, you know, an organization behind them, a group, a, a, a community. Yeah, I, th- I think you know you you have to give choices for the electorate, you know, for the voters. So we just can't, you know, uh, have only one party candidates on the ballot. Then it basically, you know, it, it brings down the turnout and uh, it adversely affects, you know, again, that is one of the uh, quality of life uh, uh, indices, you know. If the local elections, uh, the participation goes down, um, everything else goes down. Well, and I would say, too, having a candidate on the ballot from both parties is really essential to cutting down on some of the divisiveness that we see in our um, political system right now. Because where you don't have a candidate from one party, you allow the other party to control the battlefield and paint your party's candidates in whatever light they want, essentially. And so when you have a candidate there that puts forth reasonable ideas to help the community and is out there making progress and making connections, that really does you know, take away some of the caricatures that we tend to see at the national political level. Exactly. When those people don't have somebody going against them, they can say or do whatever they want because there's no threat to their position. So right. we have to make sure everybody's position is, is is being threatened, at least. What issues should we be on the lookout for during the 2020 election cycle? There are a lot of things from criminal justice reform, education, budgets, the national debt, what? foreign affairs. What? At a local level, what should, we, what should we be on the lookout for? Well... So here's, uh, maybe I'm kind of going against what I said earlier with this, but sadly, the truth is what we're going to have to be looking for locally as we bring up candidates going into 2020 is who's at the top of the ticket. Um, we, we have to get that excitement going, right? And if we don't have somebody at the top of the ticket who's going to excite people, it's going to make it really, really hard for the people uh, lower, especially in a state like Alabama that is so deep red, according to what everybody says. If there's, if, if we can't get past that that sense of, of defeat that a lot of Democrats and, and more left leaning people have in Alabama, where they feel like their vote doesn't matter, you know, we have to have somebody hopefully carrying us at the top that makes people want to come out. Like in in the case of Barack Obama, like my hometown of Mobile. You know, elected their first black mayor on the strength of Barack Obama's turnout. You know, that's the kind of thing that can happen if we have somebody on the top. So hopefully of all of the few dozen people we have running at the top, somebody comes out that's actually exciting for the masses to kind of get get folks willing to go out and work. Yeah, I I can uh, uh, talk about the local uh, issues with regard to the city of Madison and uh, the Huntsville, you know, Madison area, and as well as some of the federal issues. So with regard to the Madison city, I think in the next 2020 elections, you know, which is coming up in August uh, for 2020, um, we're going to have a lot of issues. I mean, we already have, you know, problems with the uh, with the, with the policing, uh, what we have seen, you know, in 2015, you know, when the Indian grandfather's uh, so tragedy 
and um, unfortunately the, the elected officials did not learn any lessons from that uh, incident and now we recently about with this um, uh, police involved shooting uh, in october uh, so that is going to be one of the one of the issues uh, then about uh, about the schools you know the the new schools and the tax uh, the, that passed again you know going back to what jb said regarding the taxes i mean these people uh, when they when they were running last time they said they were not interested in increasing the taxes and uh, but but they, they they kept quiet and uh, they basically allowed some uh, special interest groups you know a local pack to promote the tax increase that way you know they they were kind of you know taking the uh, political you know uh, attacks away from them so that is that's how you know these people play politics so and uh, the infrastructure the, the economic development and uh, one of the issues is definitely going to be the big you know the stadium that is coming up um, coming up in madison so now it is already done so i mean i, I have no uh, issues with uh, with the stadium because you know they have already dug the hole you know the only thing is you know we have to uh, whoever gets selected next time you know they have to make sure that you know you fill that hole um, um, of uh, this uh, tremendous debt for the city so the debt is going to be another issue for the city of madison so and you know who knows you know something else you know we still have like nine months some other important issues might uh, might come up you know maybe some ethical issues so we don't know i mean there there are a lot of problems you know um, we don't have unfortunately um, perfect uh, politicians at our local level in madison and huntsville area so that's one of the things with regard to the federal level of course you know protecting democracy is one of my <laughs> uh, you know uh, passions you know i've been saying this for the last you know two and a half years three years you know if we don't save this country from you know uh, going into this uh, becoming an authoritarian uh, regime um, then you know it, it doesn't matter you know whatever you have you know it's, it's not going to matter at all you know so that's something you know we owe it to our next generation we got to protect this country we got to protect this democracy from um, you know disappearing yeah mm-hmm. i would add um issues on a state level you know with state politics we're not you know every election cycle electing somebody so even though jb and i had our elections in 2018 those politicians who were put into office then are able to affect the laws in 2020 and we can't just ignore them because like we said these people are elected they are local it's important that we know what laws they're proposing for 2020 and to hold their feet to the fire um i would expect to see laws relating or bills proposed relating to um, prison reform relating to sentencing reform um if those are issues that are important to you as a voter, I would very much urge you to make sure that you support those bills and support the elected officials who put them forward. Currently, we have about 18 pre-filed bills already for the 2020 legislative session. Um, and you know, with Madison, we've had the recent incident outside Planet Fitness. There is a Senate bill that's already proposed, which would further repeal restrictions on Um, carrying arms on certain property and in vehicles with or without a concealed carry permit. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing several bills um, about taxation in the House, um, which propose eliminating certain taxes like business tax, the business privilege tax, inheritance and gift tax, estate taxes, or would eliminate all taxes in favor of a single use tax. Um, And the reason why people should care about these is typically with a single use tax, it's going to fall the hardest on those who can least afford it. So it's a very regressive tax system. So I'd urge you to pay close attention to these coming out. Yeah. And if I can uh, add one more, a couple of more issues. Climate change is going to be one of the major issues in 2020 elections. It's not just about... uh, uh, the, the, at the federal level or at the global level. It's going to affect our local uh, communities. I mean, we've already seen, you know, um, some of the problems with, uh, with the farmers, you know, facing because of this climate uh, crisis. So that's definitely going to uh, uh, have an impact, you know. Um, then um, with regard to the farmers, so that's going to be another issue, um, especially with the small farmers. 
um, because of the tariff you know they are facing a lot of uh, issues and uh, um, a lot of problems financial uh, problems you know they're going to face so we have to find some solutions to to help uh, uh, small farmers um, you know you bring up a really good point too about climate changes you know talking about things federal versus local you know I've noticed in a lot of other states where you know local uh, 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 local office uh, holders or people who hold local office are challenged uh, more frequently than maybe in Alabama those local places like like a place like Montana they are actually very very uh, involved in climate change and issues like that at a local level even though at a national level they're a red state and their party says you know a lot of them still say it doesn't exist or we just don't care whatever the case may be uh, they'll vote for Republicans at a, at, a, at a federal level, but on a local level, they want people who are going to protect their streams and their forest and their wildlife. And that is something that we need to do here. Uh, but, but it all starts uh, by challenging the people who are in office. They're too comfortable. One thing that stands out, because you were talking about water, when I think about limestone and Morgan County, those are the two areas where water is polluted. And you have, uh, I guess, citizens who typically vote Republican and their officials, their elected officials, um, are really dropping the ball in protecting them. How can the Democratic Party or someone running for office, not to say, I guess, take advantage of that, but use that situation to help people see as a politician, I'm either for you or against you or, you know, there's got to be some kind of process that people apply as voters to how they select their elected officials. So if you're running for office, how do you reach out to those people? Yeah, I mean, I think you brought up a very good point, uh, Jade, with regard to the Tennessee River, uh, especially downstream Limestone County. There are a lot of, you know, uh, rural, poor communities regardless of their race, you know, they are adversely affected by the pollutants that are coming out of some of these industries in, uh, 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 in Decatur. Um, so there are, there are some good organizations, you know, non-profit organizations who are trying to help uh, clean up, you know, they do, uh, you know, periodical, you know, uh, river cleanup. And uh, they're also, you know, fighting uh, these, uh, these companies, you know, through lawsuits. Um, but again, yeah, you're right, you know, you, you have to have uh, elected officials, you know, who also care about uh, the, the, the environment, you know, the, the quality of water that we drink, you know, the water that we uh, use for, you know, taking shower, you know, so that's, uh, that's one of the important issues um, in that part of the uh, county, like, you know, Limestone County and uh, Morgan County. Well, you know, I think that what Handy said is absolutely right. You know, we have these communities that are being adversely affected. And I think one of the things that has gone into play as to why it hasn't gotten more attention with election cycles is because we haven't had Democrats running until we had a bunch of Democrats run in 2018. When you have um, a party that's been in power for so long, it's, you know, the tendency is not to talk about anything that negatively impacts you. Um, and so when you have a two-party system that's functioning as it should, and you have people challenging those in power, they are really doing the groundwork, the grassroots, so to speak, of going door to door um, and letting the people of the community know what has been going on and how they can have a practical plan to fix it and how it can positively impact their life. That is the biggest thing that I have seen make an impact is where you have candidates and campaign teams go out into the community and really show people how electing people at some of these local levels can impact their day-to-day -day lives by placing, you know, really common sense plans to clean up the river or to, you know, fight political corruption. Yeah. And, and to build on that, what Amy just said, you know, and, and Amy, what part of what uh, uh, Plan for Progress is yes. doing is talking about messaging, right? So there are two parts to this. A, we got to get our messaging right. Um, it's important to be able to, you know, Republicans are real good at slogans, you know, they come up with these easy slogans that don't mean what they're doing at all. 
you know, the, the uh, what is the Accountability Act? Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Accountability to who? It, it, it's not... It's, it's not even what it sounds like, but it's really easy to say and go knock on the door and tell somebody. So the first part is the messaging. The other part is, you know, I guess I'm kind of harping on a theme here, but the other part is, you know, getting out and, and getting people involved and excited early before a candidate is even there, I believe, is the role that our Democratic Party in Alabama needs to take. Um, we've got dozens of organizations who are trying to do that in a disjointed way. We had, I mean, dozens of candidates who were trying to do that in a disjointed way. But if we could come together behind simple messages like that, like we actually care about the river and we don't want it to get polluted. And, and another point that I'll bring out is when I ran and I went back and I used, you know, all candidates are, are kind of run their campaign based on the data. And I used all of the data that was given to me to go after my likely voters, um, you know, likely voters, voters who are likely to vote for a, a left leaning Democratic candidate, voters who, you know, were engaged in all of that. And I went after all of those people and I went after those people hard and I did fairly well. But then when I went through district by district of, of the different districts where, you know, uh, were, that were a part of, of, of my um uh, of, of my house uh, district. As I go through, I see that there are certain uh, uh, precincts that had lower, several had lower than 30% turnout. One had lower than 10. And those precincts were the precincts that you would think are, are the rural white communities. They were the ones that are right on the Tennessee River, actually. Yeah. You know, like some of these precincts are precincts where to be honest, when I went to put signs at, at the place, I was scared if it was dark. I mean, it was that far out in the middle of nowhere, right? And uh, But I realized then that the data had failed me because there weren't likely voters for anybody there because nobody was talking to them. There were thousands of registered voters, but none of them were going to vote because nobody took the time to go talk to them. So there's great opportunities out there if we go and just talk to people and say, hey, Clearly, nobody's come out here to talk to you to even tell you there's an election. You, you might not even care, but we care about what's happening to you, and we want to make a difference. That's how you get that excitement going early, because somebody's actually coming and talking to you, and we understand what's going on. We care, and we can't do it without you. Well, it's interesting that you should bring that up, because that's actually what Plan for Progress is designed to do, is try to you know take democratic policies like keeping our river clean and repackaging them to people who may be showing up in our data as moderates and who haven't therefore had people come to their doorstep and you know present common sense solutions to the problems that are so intimately impacting their lives. Let's change topics real quick. Body cam, dash cam, 911 audio, should these things be considered public record or should they be as they are now privileged communications? I think with the recent shooting we had at Planet Fitness involving Dana Fletcher and going even back to the 2015 case with, I believe that was Mr. Patel. Yeah. Body cam played a big role. In the 2015 case, the body camera footage came out. In the Dana Fletcher case, it doesn't look like we're going to see that body cam footage. And I'm afraid even if there's legislation in the future, it's not going to be retroactive where we'll be able to see that uh, body cam footage. Since it's paid for with tax dollars, should it be public record or should it be privileged communication? It's a simple yes to me. I mean, uh, as you said, we paid for it. We all paid for it. We should be able to see it. I uh, understand maybe it should. You should maybe have to go fill out a form to go get it. Uh, you know, something like that. You can't just put it up on some drive for anybody to go grab because some of it may be graphic. You might not want kids to have access to it. That part I get. But anybody who fills out an application for it should be able to go and get it. Anybody who wants it, anybody who takes the time to go up there and get it should be able to go get it. And every news organization will go out and do that. And hopefully, if there's something that is too graphic for, for, for consumption, you know, like, like that part I understand. But that's the only part I understand about holding any of it back. Because some of, some of that stuff um, is the only, those videos are the only reason why people are talking about this. You know, I'm a 43-year-old black man who grew up in Alabama. And I've been telling people my whole life 
about how many times I've been pulled over and nobody even believed me because I'm such a nice guy. You know, it, nobody would, would hear me, you know, it, and, and all of a sudden these video cameras come out and it was a shock to the world. I'm like, I've been talking about this since I got thrown in the back of a car at 16 because I got beat up for carrying a backpack. You know, it, it's like, it, it's kind of one of those things where if nobody sees it, then if nobody has to see it, you know, then they don't want to see it and they're not going to see it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's uh, um, it's our taxpayer money. Um, so people have the right uh, for this, um, uh, for this you know, videos or audio, audio files. Um, but again, you know, so you, you don't want to make the entire thing as a privileged communication, you know. If there are any serious issues, you know, involved with regard to the, uh, the, the safety, you know, you don't want to divulge, you know, how you, um, you know, communicate, uh, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when some criminal activity is going on. So you you don't want to let the criminals know you know how you we, we communicate, but um, but I think with regard to the Madison City, I believe uh, the city bought the cameras after the uh, grandfather Indian grandfather incident. I'm not sure if they had you know uh, the body cam. I think it was probably dash cam footage. Um, but again, you know, what's the point in having body cams and dash cams? You know, if you can't even let the people see it you know this again comes back to the uh, restoration of you know uh, trust you know restoring trust you know uh, ensuring transparency so if you if you can't gain the trust and confidence of all the people then it's it's not going to help anyone in the in the community it's it's a it's a it's a really a bad idea not to be transparent you know not to uh, gain trust from from everyone in the community, not just from your you know eighty percent majority or you know. So that's something I I believe you know they sh they should um, uh, refresh the policies and uh, uh, come up uh, with uh, with ways to uh, release the footage at at some point you know. Yeah. Now, I come from a legal background. For those of you who don't know, I'm an appellate lawyer. Yay! So that <laughs> so. In looking at things like releasing body camera footage, um, this is something that we see states across the country grappling with how to deal with. And there are, you know, some concerns that have to be balanced, in my opinion. Certainly, you don't want to release footage too soon, so to the point where it would impact your ability to strike a jury. Um, should there be, you know, criminal activity that's ultimately found involved. Um, you also have some privacy concerns um, that are related to that. But the good news is, is that since we have a country that is grappling with how to do this, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel in terms of trying to figure out um, what are the best paths forward. You know, we see a variety of states which have taken a bunch of different approaches. Maryland currently releases um, their body camera footage according to their state public records policies. Um, you see Iowa where you can only get footage if you are a party in it or if you're a guardian of the party. But what I think probably makes the most sense and might make the most sense for Alabama is something like what Ohio is proposing, um, which would require law enforcement agencies to enact policies for responding to requests for this footage and then to make those policies publicly available. And so those policies would be able to balance both the privacy concerns, the, you know, kind of the courtroom related concerns and still, you know, provide a standardization so that the public knows when they can access that footage um, by a date certain. And we're not all left wondering when are we going to get it, if we're ever going to get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it also, you know, uh, has something to do with uh, police reforms, um, especially with regard to the Madison City. You know, I have been, I have been asking, you know, I've been fighting for this for the, uh, since 2015, 2016. I said this in 2016 uh, during the elections for the mayor. So you got to have uh, an outside agency. What I mean by outside, an independent outside agency. You know, Madison County uh, Sheriff's Department is not an outside agency from Madison City. Say that one more time. <laughs> so Madison County Sheriff's Department is not an outside agency from the city of Madison because they have professional relationships. They have working relationships. 
which is good but again they are not considered as uh, the outside agency they are not considered as an independent outside agency so uh, um, so with regard to the police reforms you know what uh, i asked uh, even last time you know when i spoke at the council to have a comprehensive uh, review by an independent third party private law enforcement consulting company there are law enforcement private consulting companies you know so they look into uh, all aspects of you know whether the how, what kind of leadership you have you know if there is any uh, hostile environment in the in the department you know are there any divisions you know because I've, after 2015 after the indian grandfather incident the madison police department was divided unfortunately you know into like two or three different camps you know people who were in saying that oh it was you know everything was according to the book you know someone was saying everything was not according to the book so you got to protect you know all all kinds of voices uh, and you have to give them the uh, you know platform to speak without fearing any retaliation from their own own boss or you know from their own colleagues in the department so that's that's the kind of thing you know unless uh, we we have this um, you know outside agency the real outside agency that's what i call fbi so i mean i strongly believe that you know i believe that uh, we still uh, need to and we should have an fbi investigation into what happened into the entire circumstances the totality not just the uh, use of force so you have to have a very broad scope of that entire incident that happened you know and one more thing i add to the conversation um maybe not a on a happy note but uh in reality you know we 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 have had quite a few states who have enacted policies and i guess it's one of the good things about alabama being last in everything you can uh <laughs> figure out which ones work before you implement it so it, it will be nice but but the thing we have to understand and, and hanu just kind of brought it up about the bigger problem uh most of the studies that i've heard uh over the last few years of states where they have implemented the body cam uh type of 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 a uh, policy whatever the policy may be what they found is putting a body cam on on police officers does not lower the incidence of uh violence against people you know it really doesn't change their decision making process you know so you know it, being the engineer in me thinks you know the root cause of of the problem it goes a lot deeper than putting a camera on somebody especially a camera that they're probably going to forget they have in the heat of the moment because all of these incidents come down to the heat of the moment right you know and when the heat of the moment comes and instincts and biases take over then you get these incidents and and afterwards they do everything they can do to cover it up and we can put in place policies that will hopefully you know bring the truth to light but the truth is there's a deeper problem with these people who um you know who who are given power to protect and serve and then they abuse that power for the very people who they're supposed to protect and serve you know as a as a community as a nation as a state you know as a people uh we really have to address um the the deeper problem when we look at our law enforcement uh officers uh, and, and there are many ways we can do it uh you know one of the things and I'll bring up uh from one of the debates that I was in uh I don't guess it's really a debate but it was kind of a town hall that I was in where uh several of the candidates were speaking to a community in North Huntsville and and all of the uh sheriff's candidates were and uh there was a lot of talk about you know how how they do their community policing and uh you know their idea of community policing our current sheriff his idea of community policing is going out to the community and finding the troublemakers and and my whole point is well if you're going out into the community instead of looking for troublemakers maybe you should be looking for officers maybe you should be looking for people cuz the other candidate was talking about how they could never have enough officers which you know <laughs> <laughs> we won't, won't even get into what that means but you know if you don't have enough officers when you're in those communities instead of looking for people to lock up why don't you look for people to lift up and bring in people who actually understand those communities you know there there there's root cause issues that we have to address as well and sticking a camera on somebody 
is a way to get hopefully justice, but it's not necessarily the way to get change. Right. Yeah. Um, one quick thought, you know, like uh, uh, we also have to, you know, support these officers. There are there are also like you know personnel issues uh, with uh, with regard to some of the departments, and you know again coming back to the Madison Police Department, you know some of the police officers you know can't even afford to live in the city of Madison mm-hmm. because the kind of pay they get, they can't even send their kids to some of the best schools in the city, which is really sad. You know why can't they send their kids because they can't afford for the time kind of pay they get. Um, they they work sometimes you know two jobs three jobs you know. Uh, during the off duty, you know, they, they go work in Walmart or in other places. Why do they have to? I mean, all these folks, you know, all these, uh, um, you know, politicians, you know, talk about supporting the law enforcement. Why can't they provide, you know, good quality um, care for, for, these, for these officers? So that's one thing. And also we have to look at the turnover. Madison City had uh, real problems. So I think... Uh, um, uh, like a few years ago, they had about 85 or 80 officers who left the force out of 103 officers who were recruited. So that's the kind of, you know, when you look at the net gain, it's, it's always, you know. So we don't know. That's, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how this uh, incident uh, that happened uh, on October is going to affect the turnover uh, in the Madison City Police Department. And I guess that's, that is something to look at, the attrition rates. Yeah. of the police department um, because that tells a story within itself. Usually attrition is a reflection of engagement and engagement is usually linked into accountability, into recognition, into development, into a whole bunch of things and our police departments have a lot of those opportunities um, to, to really be enhanced. One thing that stands out to me during Kevin Turner's press conference from the Dana Fletcher case they talk about de-escalation. When a police officer de-escalates the situation is when they give lawful orders. When I heard that definition of de-escalation, I was like, wow, that's not how I identify de-escalation. So we have an opportunity to do some calibrating on behaviors and best practices on how to better police uh, the community. Yeah. So... I mean, I, I I just you know I'm over here breathing hard because it it honestly brings back memories, you know, of of being stopped for going four miles over, uh, being asked for you know my my driver's license insurance, giving my driver's license insurance, and then being asked to get out of my car. And you know, younger, less uh, educated me thought I don't have to get out of my car, but that's a lawful order. A lawful order is for me to get out of my car if that officer uh, uh, feels he is unsafe for some reason because I'm in my Corolla and it's it, I look very dangerous. You know, and it's kind of, that's a misnomer. You know, that's one of those things I was talking about. It's one of those deeper problems, you know, where you have to train in true de-escalation. You know, true de-escalation is not ordering someone to do something and waiting to see if they're going to comply. That's not de-escalation. That is an abuse of power. And that is not the kind of thing that is going to bring, quite frankly, a grown man with pride into compliance because it does imply compliance. And that's not what we're supposed to do if we're being protected and served. If I've broken a law then fine. If I've given you some actual reason for you to think that I've done something beyond drive four miles per hour over the speed limit, then fine. But a lot of times, it, there's just a lot of deeper problems there that we have to get into. And 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 quite frankly, I don't even fault Kevin Turner for that. You know, I don't think that it's something that he's even, he probably really believes that. You know, he probably really believes that this is a good test for me to see if this is a problem. You know, I, I bet he doesn't think that he's doing anything wrong. But I guarantee you somebody from my neighborhood would understand, you know, what what that says to the person who you're saying it to. And, you know, I would throw in there, you know, if someone were to stop you, you are a, you know, normal, well-educated, you know, adult person. 
But we have a lot of people in our community who, for whatever reason, whether that be illness, whether that be um, mental or emotional issues, you never know the person who is going to be stopped and you never know what their circumstances are going to be. And so you could easily conceive of a situation where giving an order would not, you know, would not mean the same thing to someone whose faculties are limited in some way. So I would say our de-escalation is just essentially insufficient to deal with circumstances like that because we haven't invested the money or the resources in, you know, preparing people for those kinds of situations. All right, so we're going to take a break. (laughs) We've been diving into some good conversation. We have a segment of Dollars and Cents coming up with Miss D, and we'll be back in a moment here on Conversations Around the Coffee Table. Be back shortly. Hey, this is Denise, co-founder of The Wealth Culture and creator of Budget in His Bay. And on today's segment of Dollars and Cents, we are talking about Black buying power. According to Nielsen, Black Americans have $1.3 trillion in buying power. And our buying power is projected to increase to $1.5 trillion in 2022. Buying power is defined as all income from one year after tax. Buying power does not include any savings or wealth from the prior year and is concentrated solely for one 12-month cycle. Our research shows that black consumer choices have a cool factor that has created a halo effect influencing not just consumers of color, but the mainstream as well. This is from Cheryl Grace, Senior Vice President of U.S. Strategic Community Alliances and Consumer Engagement with Nielsen. These figures show that investment by conglomerates in R&D to develop products and marketing that appeal to diverse consumers is indeed paying off handsomely. Nielsen's research also shows that 38% of African Americans between the ages of 18 and 34 and 41% of those aged 35 or older expect the brands they buy to support social causes, outpacing the total population by 4% and 15% respectively. The African American consumer base is 48 million strong. We are a growing demographic made up of loyal trendsetters who are technologically savvy. These admirable characteristics, along with our growing buying power, make us a powerful force. And this powerful force can be used to help communities of color. The empowerment experiment was conducted as a research project via a foundation set up by a black, middle-class Chicago couple who partnered with Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management. The empowerment experiment sheds great insight into economic trends of black people. The one that really stood out was it showed that less than around 3% of the current black buying power is spent in black-owned enterprises. And if black Americans were to redirect just about 10% of total black spending to black owned enterprises that could translate into the creation of about 1 million jobs centered around communities of color. 1 million jobs centered around communities of color would be amazing. This data point got me to thinking about black owned companies and how I support them. And I have challenged my household to intentionally increase our spending with black owned businesses. Join us in our challenge. Let's use our black buying power to support black businesses and help create 1 million jobs. I am Denise. This has been your Dollars and Cents segment. You can check The Wealth Culture out online at thewealthculture.com or follow us on Facebook at The Wealth Culture. Thanks again, and you can catch me on Dollars and Cents in future episodes of Conversations Around the Coffee Table. See you next time. Thank you, Ms. D, for that segment of Dollars and Cents, and we are back with conversations around the coffee table. All right, so we're going to jump right back into the conversation. Criminal justice reform is on the table now. What can we do differently in Madison County, Alabama, and in the state to make changes and improve our criminal justice system? Some people don't look at it as a justice system. They just see it more of a legal system. But how do we make it more just? Well, I think one of the first things that we have to do is, you know, look at, you know, the difference between Alabama and every place else, because I think that sheds a lot of light on our issues that we're facing with criminal justice reform. You know, right now, Alabama has so many people that we are incarcerating. Our average is higher than the national average, is higher than the national average of also the United Kingdom and Canada. So we are incarcerating far too many people here in the state. We also have people who are going to jail for 
um, lengthy sentences which don't fit the proportionality of their crime. And so before you go further, there's a difference between jail and prison. Can you highlight that real quick? There is. Um, unfortunately, I am not a criminal attorney. Okay. Um, there, there is a difference in jail and prison. Jails are typically a little bit more local, whereas prisons are your more extended stays, although you can have extended stays in jails as well. Okay. And typically with jails, before you you are sentenced, if you're not able to bond out or pay your bail, they hold you in jail. And once you go through the trial phase, if you're convicted, then you're sent to a prison, or in some cases, you might go back to jail. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's one of the things, you know, that um, some organizations are looking at is making that time that you spend in jail before your sentence count as part of your sentence. So you're not essentially serving additional time on top of anything you may be ultimately sentenced to. Gotcha. And, and also, you know, following up on looking at other states and then coming back to Alabama is the uh, bail bonds uh, situation where we have people who are in jail just because they can't pay a bond or a fee or something like that and uh, how that disproportionately affects the poor. Um, a lot of states have gotten rid of um, bail bonds altogether because it actually ends up being a drain on the state. And it's also a drain on a community because when you keep those people in, they lose their jobs. It cuts down on productivity overall, hurts the economy. It's just, it's not good for anybody. So um, talking about trying to reform the criminal justice system, uh, you know, we, we, we should also make sure that the, crust, the justice system uh, stops criminalizing uh, poverty. And, and that works on both, you know, entry into the justice system and exit because there's also barriers when people get out of um, prison if they can't meet you know the cost of their probation a lot of people return you know because of poverty with that people don't realize those monitoring systems those people have to pay for that they have uh, probation fees that they have to pay for and when they come out of jail or prison they have all of those responsibilities and they're hit with the box They've got a check when they go to apply for jobs. So now, probably 70 to 80 percent of the jobs that are out there, they can't apply for because they've got to check the box. Um, yeah. Um, again, I mean, with, the, with regard to the criminal justice reform, uh, first of all, you know, we have to get rid of uh, these for-profit prisons. Hmm. So this, you know, putting people in jail, you know, in prisons has become a kind of, you know, business proposition. So these, these for-profit prisons, they, they all make a lot of money. You know, the more people they have, they, they kind of, you know, is, uh, uh, treat these people as a commodity, you know. So, uh, and also, you know, for, uh, for non-violent crimes, so you have to have uh, uh, reforms there. You know, how do you... How do you want to um, tackle those uh, um, the number of years of uh, imprisonment? You know, so those those things. Um, but uh, and also with regard to the school to prison pipeline, that's the reality. I mean, I, I honestly believe that you know it's not just you know uh, someone telling me, um, but some of these uh, some of these elected officials you know don't even acknowledge that there is a problem from school to prison. You know. Um, so that that's how they they develop, you know. Uh, they they always have this pipeline, you know, so that the more people going into the prisons, you know, the more money the it it generates for this uh, you know for, for profit uh, for profit prisons. And also, honestly, I believe it has something to do with the with the with the history of this country, you know, history of uh, the slavery. I think there is there is a direct connection between that culture of slavery and, uh, I mean, basically, you know, uh, promoting, financing slavery, and uh, currently, you know, promoting and financing mass incarceration. You know, can, can, I mean, I, and I, wanted, I really want to jump in on this because, you know, this is, you talk about the history, you know, it's actually still laid into the foundation of the Constitution. And I, I often um, find it interesting when I educate people about the 13th Amendment and the 13th Amendment says that you can basically still have slaves if they commit a crime. 
That's what that it's built in there. It's right there in the Constitution and uh, these for profit prisons and states like Alabama with that uh, sordid history uh, have absolutely exploited that since uh, since really the, the end of Reconstruction. You know, they've been taking full advantage of it uh, ever since. And, um, you know, it's very problematic. You know, it, it goes back to the earlier discussion that we had about root causes. You know, uh, the reason why the, there's a school to prison pipeline is because it's, it's, it's a conveyor belt. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a factory, you know, and that's what they're doing is they're sending people there. It, 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 you don't want to. I'm an optimist and I don't want to believe that people are actually, you know, hateful and, and just evil and and that cruel that they would do that to children. But I do feel like there is um, something about Alabama right now and our politicians who, you know, in another part, talk about reform, criminal justice reform, local politics. One of the things that I find as a candidate that was very disturbing is how easily it is to get large sums of money as a candidate if you're willing to accept large sums of money from just about any individual for sure. You know, there are certain organizations that are, have limits, but um, an individual can give you just you know, as much as they want. And and our politicians can be bought and so any. Uh, and I'll stop at this, and then there's the other thing of the incentivizing for uh, some of our um, uh, uh, prison officials to, if they if they cut money, if they cut funds, they get the bonus. They get the money. That money doesn't go back into the community. The money doesn't go back into the prisons. Doesn't go to educate uh, uh, the prisoners. Doesn't go for health. None, none of that. It goes directly into the pockets of the people running the prison. That is all kinds of bad. It's, it's just begging for corruption. And it's begging for people to it's, 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 it just incentivizes people to try to lock more people up. And also, the reforms have to have to tackle the problem of uh, recidivism. Uh, so, so I, I don't know how many of these you know prisons have uh, skills development because that is something you know we can we can actually use them for. Uh, I mean, when I say use, means like you know when they when they come out of the prison system, you know they can they can find. Uh, jobs um, I mean every, every human being has some kind of you know uh, skill so we have to uh, look at those skills you know in the, in the prisons you know what kind of skills we have and you know probably I mean I'm just thinking of my head you know so we can even use the technology I mean you have artificial intelligence you know I mean you have so many millions of prisoners right so, I mean, you, you can use uh, their skills, you know, this data and uh, come up with, you know, things that uh, that can be useful for them, you know, some of them when they, when they come out of this uh, uh, prison system. Um, but again, it has to do with, uh, with the politicians that we elect, you know. So it all depends on the politicians. So if, if people, uh, that's where, you know, the local elections also uh, play a bigger role. You know? In California, with the wildfires that they were having, the people fighting those wildfires, most of them were prisoners. Prisoners trained as firefighters. When they get out of when they when they get out of prison because they they have a felony, they cannot be firefighters. And to me, that that just seems wrong on so many levels. You train people, you spent time training people, and they are literally certified to be firefighters. Then once they leave prison, you prevent them from being firefighters. I, that's one, and I know I don't know if Alabama has anything in place where they use prisoners for things like firefighting or not. But I think we have to make sure those types of roadblocks are removed because that's a valuable skill set for someone to attain and then can't put it to use. As a voter, how do voters engage with people who are running for office to find out what types of policies they're backing or what their agenda is? What would be the best way? Because all three of you have had a chance to run for office. So how would I, as a voter, know how you feel about criminal justice reform? Well, one of the best ways is to contact, you know, either the candidates that's running. If they don't have it on their website, contact them directly, contact their office directly. You know, you ran against Mike Ball. I ran against Tom Butler. These are people who are in our communities who you can go and sit down with. And a lot of times they will answer you and schedule you an appointment. And you can ask them directly, what are their plans to 
put you know new programs in place to prepare um, our incarcerated population to re-enter um, and be productive members of society. And if you don't like their answers, you know you hold their feet to the fire and keep them accountable at the next election. Yeah, as as candidates, you know we can always put it on our website, you know, or promote it through social media, or you know we can have uh, town hall meetings. Uh, uh, interaction with uh, with the voters, you know, that's how you communicate. But you know, we we won't be able to communicate through just you know a few sound bites, you know. So we have to educate you know folks about at least the, give them the overview of uh, the policy or the proposal the candidate is willing to fight for. Yeah, going full circle. I mean, it, talking about the importance of local elections. Well, that's it. You know, it's, it's important because these are people who you can call directly, who will make time for you. Uh, as a candidate, I had several people call me directly, and I always made time for them because it was, it was interesting to just learn from them. And as much as, as they were looking to learn from me, well, what is it that you care about? What would you like me to do? You know, uh, I, I don't, at, at least if you're not a candidate who's maybe a, got a lot of hubris or an incumbent who's overly comfortable for sure um you know these local elections uh and these local politicians are very accessible you know even the ones who don't agree with you uh locally they'll usually meet you now if you try to get mo brooks you probably can't get time with mo brooks <laughs> he's on fox news <laughs> <laughs> all right changing gears again the late wife of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, she often identified America in four chapters. The first chapter, ending slavery. Second chapter, ending Jim Crow. Third chapter, obtaining civil rights. And then the fourth chapter being economic equality. I'm sorry, not economic equality, economic equity. Because there's a big difference between economic equality and economic equity. She believes Dr. King was killed because of his, his pursuit in helping black people and minorities attain economic equity. What can elected officials do to help ensure economic equity for African Americans and other minorities? So I want to jump on real quick because, you know, I, I feel like I've heard some of the same talking points uh, about why they felt he was killed. But the part that um, you might want to, we, we might want to add to the conversation is when the Poor People's Campaign began, Right. It wasn't just about African Americans. He started bringing in poor whites, right? And that's when he got killed because mm -hmm. what he was doing then was unifying the masses behind the reality and the truth that you know there is a lack of equity. You know, um, obviously, you know, we, African Americans we, we lag in just about every category when it comes to that, uh, and. There's a lot of history and a lot of reason as to why uh, the systems have been put in place to, to put us there. Uh, but the fact is, getting to that, how do we get to that? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those hard questions that it, it has a simple answer, though. And the simple answer is this. You know, I, I, I can't remember who I heard said it, you know, but for a lot of times it's it's people look to the African-American community to solve the African-American community's problems when we're not necessarily the ones creating our own problem. You know, the fact is, we have to get the greater community involved in, A, believing and understanding that there is a problem, believing and understanding that there is such a thing as institutional racism. You know, it doesn't have to come from a place of hate. It just comes from a place of history. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, it comes from a place of, uh, of, of you know, kind of inertia. You know, it's, it's, you've been slowly, you were moving in one direction very fast. And it's been slowed down, but we're, we're still, you know, held back by that force and that, that power that was going in the other direction uh, of black people's advancement. Um, so, you know, that's how do you get people to... to understand that I, I don't have the answer but I really do feel like um, in order for that problem to be solved uh, it's really going to take you know uh, 
some of the people who are still in control of those institutions that are holding up the walls and are creating the problems to understand that they are a wall and they do create a problem. So as an elected official or as someone running for an office, what are some issues you can take on that can help bring about economic equity? Yeah, the one thing about, uh, you know, bringing uh, help, um, helping, you know, African-Americans and other minorities with uh, economic equity um, is to, you know, promote and encourage more employee-owned businesses. So employee-owned, you know, like, you know, employees also become part of that. You know, that's how you, you are given equity in that, uh, in that company. Uh, that's that's a, that's a good model, you know. Unfortunately, we don't have too many. I mean, there are a few, uh, I believe, in uh, Huntsville area. So that is something that uh, that can help. And with the local economic development, you know, if you uh, a lot of uh, sometimes, you know, you see that you know, minority communities are left behind or or left out of the of the equity part of it. You know, so that's why I mean, with regard to um, giving you know work or uh, giving contracts so that's that's something you know uh, the cities the local governments can uh, can come up with some some policies you know um, obviously you know, I've, um, I haven't uh, worked on that kind of you know that's that's actually it's a very good uh, very good thought you know uh, having uh, economic equity uh, that's what is happening uh, in many many cities you know where the 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 growth happens, you know, you see the prosperity, but unfortunately it's not helping uh, everyone, you know, it's only like, you know, a few group of um, people. So that's what, I mean, with regard to Madison City, what's happening, you know, people might think, oh, there's so much going on, you know, but again, it's it's only helping a small group of people, a small select group of, you know, special interest groups, like, you know, some of these, you know, the big business folks or, you know, builders, promoters, but it's it's not actually uh, helping the overall community. Yeah, honestly, it didn't because you know we just voted to increase our property taxes for the school. I mean, if you think the the economic development is actually helping the city, then why in the world you know we had to increase the property taxes because you know we lost the revenue because of these you know sweetheart deals from the economic uh, development the which should have gone to this these schools. And that's a fact, you know, there is uh, there, there's a lot of survey. I think in 2018 or 2017, the school boards across the nation lost almost like $2 billion because of this uh, economic incentives. Cities and states giving up their taxes from the businesses right. and then turning around and raising taxes on the citizens. Yeah. So as individuals, we pay for it as opposed to companies and corporations paying for it. Right. Well, and that's why I think it's so very important when we're talking about equity to keep our eyes on the things that really create equity, kind of the building blocks of equity, which are um, available housing, available transportation, available education. So if we see segments of our community that don't have access to housing, you know, for example, they're talking about removing um, a section of housing from downtown Huntsville, which has been there forever and not replacing it. Um, then, you know, we are taking away that ability to be close to, you know, economic potential for a segment of our community. So we need elected officials who understand that these things are all interconnected, who understand the need for, you know, accessible, affordable housing um, across all different areas um, in Madison and Huntsville. Um, and then we also need to under have elected officials that understand that just because we put laws in place, they may not always function the way we want, and we have to stay on top of it. Um, one of the good things that Alabama has recently passed is we have had, you know, we've seen the passage of the Clark Figures Equal Pay Act, which makes it um, illegal for employers to discriminate again, you know, in wages against employees on the basis of either race or sex. However, um, that law does allow employers to pay people different wages for a variety of other reasons, seniority, merit, quantity, quality, or a catch-all, any other reason. And as we know from the past, where there is a loophole, people will exploit it. So I, I think what we've seen in the past is we haven't 
you know, we've had elected officials that are like, oh, I have, I have passed this law. My job is done. But that's not the end of the story because things are always changing and we're not going to see equity if we are always content with what we have. We have to be constantly making sure that our system functions the way we want it to and that the building blocks for equity are actually there and we are preserving them in our community. Yeah, I mean, when, when you talk about minorities, you know, uh, not just about African-Americans, you know, not just about people of color, you know, it can be uh, women, you know, women, women own businesses, you know, it's, uh, um, and also uh, uh, LGBTQ communities. Disabled. So, Disabled, yeah, disabled, you know, and and, uh, and also veterans, you know, there are a lot of veterans uh, among uh, African Americans, you know, among other minorities. So we can also uh, come up with policies to, to encourage, you know, veteran-owned uh, you know, businesses. So that's, uh, that, uh, again, it all boils down to having uh, ethical leadership at the, at the local level, you know, yeah. ethical and moral leadership. When I look around the cities of Huntsville and Madison, I think about you have Mid-City, Midtown, the growth that's going on downtown Madison, downtown Huntsville. And I think all of these contracts that are issued, what types of companies are getting those contracts? When I think about initiatives that go on between the city of Huntsville or Madison City and they're reaching out to the educational institutions, how often are they reaching out to Calhoun and to UAH? And you probably don't hear a and involved. And every now and then you'll hear a and name come up. But who's making those decisions? Who is making sure that that access is is equitable? Yeah, and you know, talking about the the building blocks, right? The building blocks of equity. Um, and a lot of times, you, 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 I listen to a lot of podcasts, and uh, and they they cover a lot of different studies. And one of the things that most most wealth uh, uh, that most families have accumulated, they they have in their home, right? So housing is important, but that's another one of those things where, you know, uh, housing and economic development in areas that are, you know, um, typically uh, uh, have large minority communities or even in areas that are blighted. Um, to go and do that, then you run the risk of uh, gentrification, which a lot of communities have uh, had to grapple with as well, where you start displacing people, where they uh, are not, they're, they're not uh, an active participant in the equity or they're not allowed to because they're not getting the contracts and certain opportunities. Or what's even more important to me is they don't necessarily have the skills or the knowledge to participate in some of these activities. That's where when I ran, I would often try to bring up the idea of a school to work pipeline. You know, it's one thing to say that, uh, you know, reach out to UAH and Calhoun and and A&M and Oakwood and, you know, all of these other universities. But, you know, with the rising cost of college, with me, you know, about to have two kids in college and really dealing with the rising cost of college, you know, um, what, what I... And, and really we're just reaching out and talking to kids. One of my passions is mentoring is what you understand is there are a lot of kids where college might not be the thing for them. And there are a lot of opportunities out there uh, in craftsmanship to build up those communities to make a very good wage and then to actually be able to afford to live it. Because once they get that knowledge and that skill, that's something that can't be taken away from them. And that's one of the things that I think is very, very important that uh, a lot of times we, I just feel like we've lost that idea of craftsmanship and uh, 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 apprenticeship and that idea of, of just teaching a kid a trade that they can come straight out of high school or while in high school, begin working in that trade and then go forth and be an active participant in the community. You know, one other thing I bring up, I just I saw this uh, quote not too long ago and I thought it was brilliant, where, you know, even if you're talking about an ex-convict, an ex-convict might not be able to uh, apply for uh, a job, but they can apply for an LLC. You know, they can get their own company if they have a skill set. You know, they can build a life in this country still. And, and obviously that's not the answer, but it's an answer. 
that I think we need to explore. Well, in, in Alabama, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think we've had our elected officials who have had enough of a focus on labor um, because we're an at, at will state. Um, we haven't invested in our labor unions. We haven't invested in our trade schools. Um, you know, here in Rocket City, we don't have a comprehensive airframe power plant training program, which is ridiculous because we have all of these jobs and all of these companies which are hiring people who make great livings, but we can't hire anybody local because we don't have the resources to train them. Um, and it's something we've really gotten away from, and it's a really good opportunity for local elected officials to make an impact in their community and provide some of those training jobs. But we've lost we've lost sight of how truly important um, supporting our labor, supporting our labor unions, and supporting manufacturing jobs like this really are. And speaking of labor and tying that into equity, especially for African Americans, fifty percent of wealth attained for African Americans come from income earned by public sector jobs, government jobs at the city, state, county, federal level. That's very different from other races. Entrepreneurship comes into play. But for us, 50% of that comes from government jobs. And that's a staggering fact, especially when you think about private sector jobs. A lot of times you go into private sector jobs, frontline, you might see some diversity, but when you go into the back offices, that diversity dwindles. What are some things that we can do? Because you see things like affirmative action, it's being dwindled and you know people have all kinds of reasons for not wanting to do affirmative action. Um, but how do you level the playing field? Because it's, it's not that you don't have qualified people who happen to be African-American who can go after those jobs, but for some reason, they're not getting them. Well, the, the reason, um, and, and you know, and I've dealt with this throughout my career. Uh, I've worked for two Fortune 500 companies, and, um, you know, I've fought my way into the decision room uh, many times. And, and what you see when you get into the decision room is uh, people, people, you know, and again, it's not, it doesn't, I don't believe it comes from a place of hate. I, I think it comes from a place of ignorance, but people want to help out the people they know. The problem is they don't know people like me. You know, they don't know people like me until they are actually forced to know, um, or, or not even forced, and just they just happen to know. Oh wow! You know, I met this guy through work. Um, you know, it, it is it is it's just such a difficult problem. I grapple with it all the time. It, it, it's beneficial. You know, and you got to understand, too, it's generational. But it's beneficial that we do have people who have, you know, worked their way up and are in positions to, to hire people that look like them, whether it be via uh, some policy imposition or whether it just be because, you know, when I go and I hire somebody, I have an opportunity and I, I to, to talk to a variety of people more so than just my friends or even if I'm telling my friend group and my network about this opportunity so they can apply and compete they now know so much of it is just it really is who you know but until we get more people in boardrooms and as managers and you know it's, it's, it's very hard because what I found is you know you can't force that change into the mind of someone who just thinks well you know, I really like this guy and I want to give him a chance, you know, and, and I, he goes to my church and I understand that you like this guy and you want to give him a chance and he goes to your church and you don't understand why you have to interview four strangers when you really want to help this person out. But of those four strangers, there may be a guy who is way better than him, who doesn't look like him and isn't a part of your social circle. You know, it, I've, I've had those conversations in corporate America, where you try to enlighten people on it, and you know, again, it, it, I've never really come across someone who, who is coming from a place of hate. It just comes from a place of a lack of opportunity and just the social fabric of America, where we live so separate. Yeah, I think um, it also needs to start at the school school level, you know, so the skills uh, improvement and all those things. Um, so mentorship is one one critical thing, you know, people like, you know, like JB, me and, you know, Amy, you know, we, people like us have to take some uh, lead, you know, in mentoring some of the 
uh, some of his um, school students or you know college students so that that might also help and also the way they think you know because some some people think well you know math is not my my cup of tea you know i don't know i don't even want to go there you know like science is not you know so but again we we have to identify uh, the the interest or you know the the kind of uh, a passion you know these uh, the, the, the students you know have towards a specific subject you know accordingly we have to guide them so that's something you know um, and also look at uh, the the evolution of the technology the technology is changing you know artificial intelligence you know it's going to be a big threat you know for for a lot of uh, a lot of human beings you know yeah. i mean even though human beings are developing this technology um, but you know, it only helps you know who are developing the technology so that's uh, it, it has a lot to do with our education system you know we are definitely falling behind you know countries like you know other countries in math science so unless we start from the from the school level uh, it's going to be an uphill task for for everyone so we we won't be able to compete yeah i mean so that's um, that's one of the issues that you know we have to attack you know going back to equity i would say education is such an important component to creating equity and here in Huntsville um, we can see the schools that are invested in are those schools where they are able to raise the highest property taxes and so here in Alabama we have an issue with that where you know you have children who live in rich areas of town who because of where they live get more opportunities than children who may live in, you know, places where the property taxes are not able to support the schools as well. And that that can be a real barrier for advancement and even more of a barrier if you have a child who is um, of a disadvantaged group. You know, I am a disabled, technically disabled person. I have a complete hearing loss in my right ear and went through cancer at 17 which creates issues in the workplace for me because I won't always hear things. Um, I can't always function as a, a person with absolutely no medical history or hearing does. But because I was in a good school system, because my parents were lucky enough, I had enough of an opportunity to allow me to compensate for some of the challenges that I faced. Um, and I've known other, ch- you know, other I say children, I'm an adult now, but other people in my peer group who came from different school systems who didn't have those advantages and they didn't have all of the opportunities as a result that I did. And so I think it's important that when we look at um, underserved communities, we have to acknowledge that the way we fund our education is contributing to, you know, creating these barriers to people at a very, very early age that we are not then helping them climb over. Can I throw in one more thing? One more quick thing. One more quick thing. And and one more quick thing about it. You know, uh, going to, and it's been the theme, you know, of education and and reaching back and and helping people is pretty much all of us have said, you know, uh, but from a policy standpoint, um, you know, it should be okay in some way for our public officials to incentivize companies and local businesses to reach back with mentors, with people who are looking for an apprentice. You know, I I understand that some of those opportunities are there, but they got to, you know, your, your local officials should be out there fighting for you, for his school or her school. You know, this school in my district, I want you to have a working relationship with company X. Company X, I need you to send 20 people annually to come down here and teach 50 kids how to do that. And and that's the kind of thing that if, if you can set targets like that, where it's a mutually beneficial situation, the kids are learning, the companies are getting cheap labor and it's not prisons and prisoners, you know, and, and they're actually, there's a production, there's a production of future citizens who are going to be productive and then there's a production of goods and and, and uh, uh, economic growth and opportunity. And maybe that can be tied to some of those tax breaks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. So sitting here with Amy, Hanu, and JB, we're almost at a point where we're ready to wrap up, but we want to take a quick break 
Then we're going to come back and do a quick three. You're listening to Conversations Around the Coffee Table. We'll be back in a moment. Are you a business owner? Are you looking to promote your business? You can advertise your business during Real Talk with Jay Presents Conversations Around the Coffee Table. Reach an audience that will seek to support your business by advertising with us. Call me today for details. 256-651-5385. Just close your eyes and imagine hearing your commercial right here on Conversations Around the Coffee Table. We're back here on Conversations Around the Coffee Table, and we're ready to do a quick three with our guest. So, first question, if you could have coffee with anyone from history, who would you have coffee with? Prince. Now I gotta ask why. Man, you know, I didn't realize how big of a fan of Prince I was until he died. Uh, I missed an opportunity to see him live. That was on my bucket list. I felt real bad about it. But more importantly, what I found out after he died, which it kind of sucks what you learn about a person after he dies, um, is all that he had done for his community, and not only in Minnesota, but for people all over the globe, really. Now, he had spent so much time just helping people and directing people in, in their art, in their craft. You know, he, he, he was this reclusive, but absolutely just ever present guiding light for so many people. And uh, if if I could meet anybody, you know, it would be him, you know, maybe we play some basketball, drink some coffee, you know, uh, just, just just hang out. I really would. I, I would that that's the guy. That's the person. Okay. So um, just just one person to have coffee with? Just one person to have coffee with. Just one person, okay. Um, um, I think you know, having watched the debates in the last few days, I would like to have coffee with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Windman, Alexander Windman. Explain why. Well, you know, he, sh- he showed tremendous courage and he actually showed how a real patriot looks like. I mean, he, he displayed his patriotism and he truly lived up to the oath that he took, you know, unlike others, you know. Yeah. And he's also an immigrant, just like me. Okay. That true patriotism, I think a lot of times that word patriot gets very cloudy right. with how it's defined. So mm-hmm. I like that. Amy? Uh, well, there's so many people I'd want to have coffee with. But, you know, if we're, if we're talking from a political um, standpoint, you know, one of the founding fathers, maybe Alexander Hamilton, because, you know, we talk about tra- patriotism all the time, and a lot of times you hear people talk about the founding fathers as though they were all of one mind, and they weren't. And it's so important, you know, I think to, you know, remind ourselves that there are all of, not only these varying ideals about what America can be, but also different perspectives about how we get there. Mm-hmm. Um and I think it would be really neat to hear the perspective firsthand from someone who fought for this country. All right. Next question. If you could put one picture of a president in your office, on the wall, which president would it be? Grover Cleveland. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it would be Barack Obama. Um, you know, I will say, I, you know, I, I, I was very much a political skeptic. Uh, and still am a political skeptic. I mean, that's that's just kind of who I am. And when he came uh, out of nowhere as this great big star, I thought, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust this guy. You know, why 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 do they like him? Why do the why did the powers that be like him so much? Uh, you know, I, I was very wary, and uh, you know, I watched him handle himself for eight years. Uh, I wasn't always happy with what he did. I wasn't always happy with some of the policies that he he implemented, but the way he carried himself, uh, the way he represented his family him, and himself and this country, uh, it was just very admirable. I remember, at, I, and I never, I never posted anything in support of Barack Obama for the entire eight years because I wanted to be impartial. But as soon as he was gone, you know. I remember having a conversation with some of my friends right after the November election where we were all like, man, what are we going to do? 
That's what we knew. That's what we knew. It was like a three day window. Yeah, it was like, man, what are we gonna do? <laughs> and um and uh, you know, we had a long conversation. I said, But man, you know, I really I really look up to Barack Obama and what he did and, and I said, Well why? Why why would you look up to, to him, to any man? And I said, you know, who knows what all he was going through? And that's just it. We don't know what all he was going through because of how he carried himself. You know, and through it all, he seemed very impassioned about helping people. You know, helping people. And uh, and he seemed to be a very genuine person. I, and obviously, you never know for sure, but, you know, if I had a second person to have coffee with, it, it might be him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I also have to go with uh, uh, President Obama. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you know, I, I, I really admired him. Um, in fact, you know, during his... Uh, re-election the day you know when the election results were coming out you know some folks uh, were kind of you know concerned freaking out you know whether he was going to win re-election and uh, I mean I kind of you know I was I was very confident you know I said don't, don't worry he's, he's definitely going to win for the second term um, but again you know there's a lot of things you know I mean if one Quick point, I mean, you can actually see the contrast between the current occupant of the White House and uh, President Obama and uh, with other, other you know, uh, past presidents. So that's, that's pretty much, you know, okay. summarizes. And Amy? Hands down, Barack Obama. Um, I remember, you know, being in law school and, you know, I, I had gotten cancer at 17 and I was looking at my future knowing at that point that if my health insurance ever lapsed, I would not be allowed to purchase insurance because I would be deemed uninsurable because I'd be too expensive for the system. And to have a president with the, you know, the courage um, to step forward and get rid of, you know, these barriers for people with pre-existing conditions, um, that's the kind of political leadership that we need. Um, and so I was very inspired um, by him when he did that. It really shows the impact they can have, you know, your elected officials and people can have on their system when they, you know, are willing to make a stand. All right. Last question. You have the opportunity to travel anywhere in the world. Where would you go? Start with me again. Uh, I, I mean, I've always said I want to go. I want to go to Ghana. Um, I want to go to West Africa. I actually just got my twenty three and me back this week, <laughs> 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 and I'm uh, I'm mostly Nigerian and and, and uh, Gun, I don't even know how to say Ghanaian. I don't know, but uh, you know that's where we're from. Uh, that's where my ancestors are from. Uh, I I, I want to go see the slave castles. I want to go back to where it all started. Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many so many countries I, I like to, but uh, um, I mean, Waffle, you know, we have been thinking of going to Sweden. Um, that's because, you know, my my brother's, you know, daughter and son-in-law are, are moving there. They were in London until recently, but now they're they're moving to Sweden, so that's one country <laughs> that I like to. You ski? No, I don't ski. <laughs> I, am... <laughs> I heard you have to if you go to Sweden. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's required. Yeah, it's required. Oh, it's required. Okay, yeah, yeah. maybe I can. Yeah. It's like being in Alabama and not picking Auburn or Alabama. <laughs> got to, got to be one of them. Right. <laughs> All right, Amy. Well, I'm going to apologize for my answer at the beginning of this question because clearly I'm hungry. <laughs> um, I would go to Germany. Um, now, my family is German. Um, I love German food so much. And right now, that's what I want is food. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that'll change one day when I'm, when I'm not craving. <laughs> All right. So, thank you guys for coming 
and sitting around the coffee table this evening. I think we've had a chance to talk about some very important topics, especially those concerning the 2020 election as it's getting ready to come up. Some pers perspectives that we need to have for our preparation as voters and how we need to look at candidates that will be representing us after the election and once we get those folks in office. So thank you for joining me this evening. And for those of you out there in the audience, I thank you for listening. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, like the channel, like us on Facebook, and we will catch you next time here on Conversations Around the Coffee Table.